Today's message is women in ministry. Everybody say women in ministry. Well, if you want a controversial topic, you found it. Women in ministry was difficult at the beginning when the first female disciples saw that Jesus had resurrected first. They saw that he was alive first and went back to tell the men what the gospels say is that the men, when they heard it from the women, it was like wives tales. They couldn't believe it. It's like, oh, what are these silly women saying? And it's very interesting. Jesus does everything on purpose. He appeared to Mary and the women first and the women went and proclaimed the resurrection first. Now, who is the first one to eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden? Who is the first one between Adam and Eve? Who is first? We know. Okay, so it was Eve first. Eve ate the fruit first. She did. And then Adam ate because his wife compelled him. So you could say that the wife fell first. And then the husband, who wasn't protecting her, wasn't standing up with the word of God, wasn't doing his duty, fell also. And then that created this uh, this world where we have a lot of feminism, where women all throughout the Bible and even today started to rule over men. They make the decisions. Hey, let's eat this fruit. Husband goes, OK, we'll eat the fruit. We'll disobey God because my wife said to do it. And it put us on this path of rebellion, both parties being in rebellion, men not leading, women taking lead when they're not supposed to. But that all applies to marriage. It doesn't apply to ministry. And we're going to see that difference in scripture. You can affirm that wives are to submit to their husbands and also affirm that women can be pastors and be in positions of authority within the church. And I will show you with scripture why that is true. This is important to understand because most people fall into one of two categories. Women must submit and they can't be pastors or women can be pastors and they don't have to submit. But I'm here to tell you that there is a much more nuanced and biblical belief, and that is that women can be pastors and they must submit to their husbands. Okay, and you usually don't hear this argument. You get put into one of those two camps. Well, I've always said this. The path of truth usually has two ditches, two extremist views and then one biblical view. When you're on a road, there's always two ditches to catch the water and to catch the runoff and all of that. Well, people, what they tend to do is fall into a ditch and then they start to repent and correct out of that ditch. And then they sort of get the right doctrine, but then they overcorrect and they end up in the other ditch. And that's why you have people who say women can't be pastors and they must submit. And women who say women can be pastors and they don't have to submit. What if I told you that today you'll see in the Bible that women can be pastors and they're to submit to their husbands. But that doesn't mean all men in general all of the time. Okay. Does that, is this making some sense? I know it's, I'm giving, this is a prologue, but it is, does that at least make sense that I'm saying that there's a third option? Everybody say third option, third option that a lot of people don't talk about. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. We're so glad that you're here. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends so they can hear the word of God and subscribe to the channel. Let's go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter two. We're going to start here because this is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. This is where things changed. And here's the deal. When you look at the Old Testament, you'll see only men were Levitical priests. Only men were in these uh, priestly positions. However, Isaiah had a prophetess wife and there were prophetesses in the Old Testament. So there were women operating by the spirit preaching to Israel, which I'm going to point out. But there weren't specifically priests. Okay, and so it was tough when women came to men in the in the New Testament, in the Gospels and said, Jesus is resurrected. Listen, at the core of the gospel, what is the message? If you are preaching the gospel to other people, what is the message? Jesus is alive. That's the core of the message. Jesus, even here at Pentecost, what's their main message to the crowd? It's not actually that Jesus died, though they talk about, yes, Jesus died. You killed him. Right. And they're cut to the heart. That's there. But what is their primary focus and what is the primary focus of the gospel? Because if Jesus died but didn't resurrect, the gospel doesn't actually exist. The good news is that though he died three days later, he came back to life. And that's what Peter's preaching here in Acts chapter two. And here's what he says when he quotes the prophet Joel in verse 16, Acts chapter two, verse 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Everybody say, sons and daughters, sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women. Everybody say men and women. Men and women. Both men and women. I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Prophesy is not just indicating future events. We actually talked about false prophets last week, false and, and true prophets. Prophesy includes telling people the gospel. It includes calling people to repentance from sin. It's, it's all kinds of, of practices and actions and words. It's not just one event. It's not just foretelling future events. It's all kinds of things. And we have God saying through the prophet Joel in the Old Testament and now being affirmed in the New Testament at Pentecost that when God gave his spirit, he would give it to both men and women and that they all would prophesy. Everybody say, all prophesy. All prophesy. And they shall prophesy prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's the point of the prophesying according to the context of that passage? So that people will be saved. Both men and women will receive the spirit so that people will be saved. Women with the Holy Spirit in them, can tell a man, hey, you need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. That's not unbiblical. In fact, it would be wrong for the woman to go, oh, well, I know that I feel the Lord telling me to go and tell them the gospel and to preach the repentance and to tell them the truth, but I'm a woman, so I can't. No, see, we don't want to limit the Holy Spirit. And we'll get into that as we continue on. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 34 we don't want to limit the spirit. Why? Look at this. John 3, 34. Jesus said this. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. Everybody say without measure. Without measure. So if the spirit, according to Joel and according to Peter, is going to be poured out on men and women, that spirit is without measure. Here's what I want you to start seeing. I want you to use spiritual lenses and not earthly lenses. Look past the physical makeup of the body. Everyone is a spirit inside of a body. Okay? Everyone is a spirit inside of a body. When that person becomes one with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit enters them, listen, is the Holy Spirit limited because the body has a womb? I'm making a point here about the Holy Spirit, not about the woman. Is the Holy Spirit inside of a vessel limited by a womb? Because what we're teaching when we say a woman can't do certain things, we're saying that because she has this makeup, the Holy Spirit can't do something through them. And what Jesus said is when God gives the Spirit, He does so without measure. Another way of saying it is without limit. In the NIV, it says without limit. There is no limit to the measure. Oh, when I pour out my spirit into women, there'll be a limit to the measure of what they can say. And some would say, well, they can preach to other women the full gospel and all of that. I will show you through scripture. There are women teaching men even in the New Testament. Priscilla teaches Apollos explicitly. And if we don't get our doctrine right, we're going to think she was sinning. If this sounds good to you so far, say amen. amen. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 and 20. It says this, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. All right, so don't quench the Holy Spirit in men or women. Don't despise prophetic utterances. On your sons and daughters, they shall prophesy. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Why? The Spirit is without limit. When the Spirit is given to men and women, it's without limit. And what that means is, when they prophesy, 
Don't despise it. Because what you're despising is not the woman. You're despising the spirit speaking through the woman. I can tell you that my genetics do not make me a better minister. It is the spirit of God in me that qualifies me to preach to you. And that spirit is without limit. So if that spirit exists within women as well, that spirit is without limit in them. And that is why we must not despise prophetic utterances because the prophet Joel and really God speaking through the prophet Joel said that sons and daughters, male and female servants would prophesy. Why? So that people could be saved. Do not quench the spirit. You have to at least consider the fact that we might be quenching the spirit. Maybe you're not convinced yet. That's fine. I got a whole sermon to go. But we have to recognize that men and women would have the spirit, that the spirit is without limit, and we're not supposed to quench the spirit. So we better be real careful before we start limiting people speaking by the spirit of God. Because you might be doing the work of Satan, thinking you're doing the work of God, shutting someone down from preaching. I heard Christine Kane, I don't, I don't listen to her a lot, but I heard a, a quick message from her. She, she honored God as Father, affirmed the Trinity, honored the patriarchs, taught the gospel correctly, and called people to repentance all within like 10 minutes. I noted all the things she did in 10 minutes. And some people in the crowd were men. And there are many that would believe what she just did was the devil's work. And I would go, at what part? Because everything she said was biblically sound. I get it. I get it. Folks, there are women and men who say goofy things. There are women with the Jezebel feminist spirit that sit in a pulpit, not because they want to present the gospel, but because they want to make a statement for feminism. That's not somebody that's called. And that's not what I'm talking about. Men do it too. Men stand in a position of authority because they like the authority, not because they're trying to preach the gospel and get people saved. So both men and women are guilty of this issue. That has nothing to do with the gender itself. That has to do with the heart of the person. Both men and women can have the wrong heart. They must be called. All right, let me give you a list of some people. Can I give you a list? Let me give you a list of some ladies. I'm going to start with the Old Testament. Okay? Miriam is regarded a prophetess in Exodus 15. I'm just going to give you a list of the Old Testament, okay? And then we'll actually open up to some of the New Testament. Huldah is a prophetess in 2 Kings chapter 22. Deborah is a prophetess and judge in the book of Judges chapters 4 and 5. Let me just pause on Deborah for a moment. Deborah ruled Israel. Deborah ruled Israel as a judge. The judge at this time ruled the Israelites. This is before kings. This is when there were judges and prophets. Deborah ruled Israel. Deborah won military victories by the Spirit of God. Barak, listen, Barak was supposed to go and be the, the top dog. He was supposed to win some battles and he was too afraid and Deborah wasn't. And Deborah said, well, the Lord will give the honor and victory into the hands of a woman because you wouldn't rise up and do what was right. Okay, so you're going to tell me in the Old Testament, Deborah in the Old Covenant is under less restriction than women in the New Covenant. That's what we're going to conclude. They're under less restriction than women in the New Covenant. Really, I, just, think about, just think about it logically for a second. Oh yeah, in the Old Covenant, when things were much more difficult according to the laws of God, women had more freedom. Give me a break. 
Abigail, she's a prophetess in 1 Samuel 25, 28 through 33. She actually prophesies. Jews regard her as a prophetess as well. She prophesies about David's reign. Before she marries him, she's still with uh, Nabal at that point. Esther, the whole book of Esther. You know you weren't supposed to go before the king, right? And God told her to go before the king. You know, it was against the earthly rules. It wasn't against God's rules because God can call a woman to do whatever he tells her to do. But it was against the earthly rules. She goes before the king and saves the nation of Israel. Deborah saved the nation of Israel. Esther saved the nation of Israel. It's not just men who did it. If you stop and take a moment. Ruth, Naomi, they're regarded as prophetesses. Isaiah's wife, which we don't learn a whole lot about, but in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3, he's married to a prophetess. So we know that. And she's called the prophetess. We don't know her name. We know she's a prophetess. Okay, now we're going to look at New Covenant, New Testament. Because I've literally had people go, well, that's Old Covenant, that's Old Testament, so it doesn't count. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Let's look at the New Covenant where the Spirit is poured out on all believers. See, back then it was like, yeah, Deborah had a special portion of the Spirit in order to be a judge. But let's look at the New Covenant, where all believers. Let's go to Romans chapter 16, verse 7. All right. So the NIV and the NASB, you actually can see the active argument in this verse. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Okay. So greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Okay. The NIV and several other translations say Junia. This one says Junius to try and make it masculine. It's a feminine word, a feminine name. Junia is regarded as, of course, kinsmen and fellow prisoners with Paul, but they're outstanding among the apostles. He's indicating that Andronicus and Junia are in apostleship. They are apostles. Now, I'm not expecting you from one verse to go, oh, there it is, we got it. But let's consider that. Let's consider that. Junia is regarded as an apostle. Now, let me present to you Priscilla. Priscilla is also in Romans 16, so we'll stay here. She's in verse 3. <clears throat> And ASB, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, for who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Here's the problem. Verse 5 says the church that's in their house. Prisca is listed first. The name's actually translated Priscilla. And IV also says Priscilla. Their husband and wife team. She's listed first almost every time, which is not normal for a wife with a feminine name to be listed first. Men get listed first, not wives. Why would that be? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to see another passage that refers to her. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. This time, the husband is listed first. Two other times, the wife is listed first. What's going on there? What it sounds like to me is that they're both ministers of the gospel. And Paul has no problem listing Priscilla first when she's operating in eldership alongside her husband. In fact, here's the real one that really should get us thinking. Acts chapter 18 Apollos is preaching here. Apollos is a man, of course. Look at this. Acts 18, verses 24 through 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. Here's a man says he's eloquent, says he, he's well-spoken, he knows the scriptures, he's preaching about Jesus accurately, but he only knows the baptism of John, so he has some more to learn. 
And what is said here in verse 26? And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla, <laughs> they translate it correctly here. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This doesn't say Aquila took him aside. This says Priscilla listed first and Aquila. You know, it, when there's couples who are both in ministry, one might have more anointing than the other. You know, it's possible that Priscilla is being listed first multiple times in Paul's letters because she's of the greater of anointing between the two. And in the church, he's honoring her. But let me point something out here. This is a well-spoken man, a minister of the gospel. This is not just a guy in the street that she's preaching to. Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They, together, not just the man, taught Apollos God's word together accurately. If you don't discern what Paul has written to wives only correctly, you will believe that a woman can't teach a man. And you're going to quote Timothy and Corinthians, which we are going to get to. Don't worry. <laughs> but you're going to quote Timothy and Corinthians, just like everybody does. And you're going to say, look, right here it says, women, I suffer not a woman to teach. And then you're going to run into not only those Old Testament ladies, but you're going to run into Priscilla teaching a well-learned, well-spoken Christian teacher. Priscilla's here explaining to him God's word better and more accurately. She's teaching him more doctrine. And you're going to say, well, something's wrong here because Paul's writing in Romans that Priscilla's got a church in her house. Luke's writing in Acts that Priscilla's teaching a man, a well-learned man. And then we're going to read Timothy and we're going to go, I suffer not a woman to teach. And we're going to go, oh, <laughs> contradiction. No. I'll present to you early, we will get to it, that Timothy and Corinthians are mistranslated. The word for woman and wife are the same word and context determines what's being said. So I'm going to present to you women first so that by the time we get to Timothy, you can start to see that they're not in rebellion to the word of God. If that interests you, say amen. amen. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Did Priscilla sin? According to the I suffer not a woman to teach. And there is no exception. It doesn't say unless her husband's standing next to her. There is, I suffer not a woman to teach. I do not, or if you read the NIV, I do not permit a woman to teach. Interestingly enough, in the NIV it says, well, it could mean wife. It does say that in the footnotes. It, it could mean wife. But that would upend the current paradigm. See, you, just because the whole church right now is thinking a certain way doesn't mean that the church has always thought that way. You might say, well, for 1,700 years, sure, but what about that first 300 years of the early church? How did they behave? They behaved a lot differently than Constantine and the Catholic Roman bishops behaved and influenced the rest of the church for the last 1,700 years. That, that, that early church for those first three centuries did not act like us. They kept Sabbath. Their women were teaching. Of course, priests were able to marry. Protestants figured that one out. But you know that a Catholic priest still cannot marry. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that that is supposed to be the case for ministers. Peter had a wife. Paul said he could take a believing wife if he wanted. Okay, so I submit to you that the early church functioned correctly, not the current church. And if the current church wants to truly reform not just what got started 500 years ago, then we have to really be sola scriptura and stick to what the scriptures say. And I see Priscilla teaching a man. 
And so now I have to go and look at Timothy and Corinthians more deeply. And I have to be willing to accept what the scriptures say. Or I've got to call Priscilla a sinner here. And that's if you arrive at that conclusion, okay, good luck to you. But I'm going to show you a scripture that she's not sinning. Nympha, also a female, wouldn't be surprised if the NASB... Oh, still translated Nympha. That's great. Colossians 4.15. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. Let me make a point about Nympha. Just like Priscilla. First off, she's listed only. There's no man listed in this case. Secondly, you're meaning to tell me that when Paul is writing to the Colossians, he gives no honor to the senior male pastor at this church. He only says Nympha. He gives no honor to the male pastor. He just totally ignores him. Think about my church. Think about if my church met in Heather's house. So we had church meetings in Heather's house. And the apostle wrote to us. And he said, greet Heather and the church in her house. And said nothing about the minister appointed. That's just not how Paul behaves in his letters. He always identifies male or female ministers and gives them honor and thanks them for what they're doing for the gospel. Always. So the fact that he says an infant in the church that is in her house indicates that this is a woman with a church in her house. And there is not a male overseeing that particular church. Now, is she under Paul's apostleship? Yeah. If we're true ministers, we all should be in some sort of community with other authorities. But there is no male eldership listed for this woman and the church in her house. It is fair to conclude that she's pastoring that church. It is not bizarre to conclude that. Phoebe, Romans 16, 1 and 2. I love Phoebe. Let me tell you why. I bet you didn't even know there were this many women in the New Testament listed. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sencrii. Thank you oh, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Let me make a point about Phoebe. She's listed first in Paul's greeting in Romans 16. Phoebe being listed first and him saying, hey, receive her in the Lord. Okay, that means Phoebe delivered the letter. I want you to understand something about how this works. This is actually a bit of church history. The person who delivers the letter, get this, reads the letter. Get this as well, reads the letter to the congregation. Whoever delivers the letter reads the letter to the congregation. Whether that's Titus or Timothy or Phoebe, it doesn't matter. Whoever brings the letter reads the letter. Phoebe delivered the letter. Receive her. Why? She brought this letter. Receive her. Phoebe reads the letter. Whoever delivers the letter, whether Titus, Timothy, or Phoebe, I'm just, I'm listing men that you know as well as Phoebe, who you might have just met. They answer all biblical questions pertaining to the letter that the apostle sent them with. The one who reads the letter knows the doctrine in the letter best. The church is receiving the doctrine from the letter. The one who brings the letter has been entrusted to properly answer questions that relate to the letter. Guys, we really got to think this through. We got Priscilla teaching a man. We got Nympha with a church in her house by herself. No husband. Priscilla has a husband. How does that dynamic work? Well, Priscilla submits to her husband, Aquila, but not to all men everywhere all the time just because they're a man. 
Nympha has a church in her house. Phoebe's delivering Paul's letters and then answering and teaching according to what the letter says. Anna. Anna's in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 2. Let's read about Anna. So Jesus has just been born. Uh, or conceived. And look at what she says. Verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him, Jesus, if you read the context, Speak of him to all those who are looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Anna knows that the Messiah has arrived and begins telling the whole temple about him. And it says that she began to speak of him or continue to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She began to teach people what the prophets had said about the Messiah's arrival so that they could understand. She, being a prophetess, understood the scriptures and began to teach all who wanted to understand that the Messiah had arrived. Amen. Does it say all or does it say, and she went over to the women's luncheon and taught only women? No, it says all. She's in the temple speaking to all about the redemption, about the Messiah who has arrived. Isn't that interesting? So we've got women preaching Jesus to all here in Luke, in Romans, in Colossians, in Acts. Women are telling men about Jesus. If you're still anti-women speaking in the church, maybe you're starting to soften up a little bit because this is a lot of evidence, guys. I've never heard anybody not anyone who's anti-women teaching ever address all of these women. They might like address one. They'll address Junior. They'll go, oh, Junior's a man's name. I've heard that. No, it's a women's name. Philip's daughters in Acts 21. Let's go to Acts 21. Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. says this. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. So this man is regarded as a genuine minister by the apostles. Philip is an evangelist. They recognize him, and they also recognize his daughters. Do you realize the honor of being written into Scripture and being recognized by the apostles? They recognize and honor the daughters as prophetesses. I don't know. We're listing a lot of women in ministry for women to not be allowed to be in ministry. I know that some are going to need the Timothy and Corinthian argument made and, and, and undone. I get that. We're going to get to that. But boy, did you know there were this many women that had titles and positions in the church? Also, Phoebe's listed as a deacon in Romans 16, by the way, which there are deaconess rules in the epistles. All right, so Philip's daughters are prophetesses. Mary and the women... They're the first preachers of the gospel to men. Jesus resurrected. They're the first ones to go and say something about it. Let's look at John 20. John 20, 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. 
I want you to realize that Jesus can do that. He does it more than once. You might have already met him. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I've seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. So she's the first one. Women are the first ones to announce. Look at Luke's version. Luke 24, 9 through 11. Do you think Jesus just, oh, oh, it happened to be a woman at my tomb. No. He wanted us to see the difference. Eve had fallen first and a woman preached the gospel first. Eve fell first. And a woman preached the gospel first. Are you getting that? Jesus is showing us the redemption is full and total. A woman ate the fruit and rebelled first. A woman believed that he had resurrected and went and told others first. Hello. Luke 24, 9 through 11. And returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Listen, so she's just gotten back from the tomb, all these ladies. Verse 10. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. Still true today. Oh, you women can't tell us anything. Eve fell first. And a woman believes that he resurrected first. You notice that they didn't believe that he had resurrected first. They didn't believe. She did first. Eve stopped believing God and ate the fruit. Mary started believing God and told others the truth. There's a reason for this event. Jesus is showing the full redemption of humanity, men and women. The Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. 39, whoops, sorry. John chapter 4, verse 39. So the woman at the well, Jesus speaks to her. She recognizes that he's a prophet. Look at what it says in verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. She went to her whole town, men and women, and told them who Jesus was. And many were saved and believed. So she's regarded as an evangelist. That's the work of evangelism. And then Philippians 4, 2 and 3. Yodia and Syntyche. Verses 2 and 3, Philippians 4, 2 and 3. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Women doing the work of the gospel alongside Paul. Shouldn't be any surprise at this point. Okay. So we see, according to Acts, and Peter's quoting Joel, and Joel is speaking for God, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters, men and women will prophesy. We see women are the first ones to preach the gospel to men, just like a woman was the first one to eat and fall. A woman was the first one to be redeemed after Jesus had resurrected. We see Priscilla teaching a man. We see Nympha with a church in her house. No male leadership listed. We see Phoebe bringing Paul's letter to Rome. It's not a small... People think that's not a big... That's a big deal. She's counted as a deaconess and she brings the letter to read to the church. 
How's that for women keep silent in the church? How could that even be possible? Women keep silent in the church. Well, my Bible says it right here. Have you not learned to look at the Greek and the Hebrew when it's something controversial? You must, you must, if there's controversy, go to the Greek. You must. Because as much as we don't want this to be true, men adulterate what's written. In their translations, they read their own beliefs into the translation. That's why you have to look at the originals. And thanks be to God, we have concordances. All right. So let's read 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. This is more, more often quoted than the Corinthians passage. We will address the Corinthians passage. Okay. Here we go. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Let's break this down together. I've shown you that men and women have the Spirit, that the Spirit's without limit, that there are women in the Old and New Testament that were in positions of authority, that they did do things in the midst of men, not just at women's groups. Because that's the next thing is, oh, well, women can be pastors, sometimes you'll hear that, of women. I don't know. Deborah led Barak into battle. Priscilla's listed first while preaching to Apollos. You tell me. Is the spirit quenched? Are we limiting the spirit? Are we quenching the spirit? Are we allowing the spirit to speak through men and women or just men? All right, so let's read. You guys knew I'm not going to shy away from this, the strongest passages against women being in ministry, right? 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Verse 15 undoes the whole doctrine, but we'll get there. Most people don't, they don't even, ask somebody who teaches that women aren't allowed to teach to explain verse 15. Explain verse 15 to me, brother. I just see what they say. They're going to stumble and fumble because it's not an easy verse. It's not an easy verse. Verse 11. I want to remind you of something. This word woman, gyun or jin. A woman, married or unmarried. What does that mean? I'm showing you. Married or unmarried. Same word, whether married or unmarried. Okay, so context determines whether we're talking about a woman or a wife. Well, let's consider some things. When you hear the word submission elsewhere, in Ephesians and in Peter's epistle, he's talking to wives, not women. And what does he say? What do Paul and Peter say to wives? Submit yourselves to your husbands. Peter says it in 1 Peter. Paul says it in Ephesians 5 and elsewhere, but those are the two main ones. Submit yourselves. So we see a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Okay, so we're seeing submission. Where else do we see women submitting to men in the general sense other than Timothy? Give me an example. I've already shown you Deborah and Esther. And I'm not saying in most cases they weren't in submission. I'm just saying Deborah, Barak was not her husband. She didn't have to submit to him. Esther did need to submit to her husband and yet God told her to go before the throne to save Israel. And then, of course, we have Priscilla, Nympha, Phoebe, Anna, all kinds of women. Do you submit to preachers? Sure. Men and women are supposed to be in submission to church authorities as long as they're behaving in accordance with the word of God. You have every right to disobey if they're doing something evil. But so does a wife. 
I've made this point before. If the husband says, hey, honey, we're going to go to a strip club this weekend. The wife does not have to go, oh, well, Ephesians says, submit to your husbands and everything. No, everything righteous. You need to rightly divide the word and understand what's being said. Submit to your husbands when they're being righteous. It's the same argument with government. Submit to the government when they're doing what's right. If you lived in China and they said, hey, you've got to abort your baby because you've got too many babies, which they do that in China, by the way. Are you supposed to go, oh, the Bible says that Romans 13, I'm supposed to obey the government. No. Rightly divide the word of truth. Know under what circumstances you submit and under which circumstances you do not. Peter was not supposed to submit to the high priest when the high priest, who normally he's to submit to, told him not to preach in Jesus' name. He said, we must obey God rather than human beings in Acts 5. We just preached on that a couple weeks ago. Okay, so do women submit to men in general or do wives submit to husbands and the church to preachers as long as they're obeying God? Yes, there is submission of women to men and it's wives to husbands and women to ministers who are obeying God. There is no general command in Scripture for women to submit to men just by virtue of their being a man and her virtue of being a woman. The first time we see women's submission to men is between Adam and Eve and God says, he shall rule over you to Eve. You understand that? And who is Adam? Her husband. So let's read this as wife. If we read it as woman, but it also can be wife, can we read it as wife as well? Let's read it as wife. A woman must, no, I'm sorry, a wife must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now that's sounding more in line with everything else we hear about a wife with her husband. A wife must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a wife to teach or exercise authority over her husband but to remain quiet. For it was Adam, the husband, who was formed first, and then Eve, the wife. And it was not Adam, the husband, who was deceived, but the wife, being deceived, fell into transgression. But wives will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Here's, how, here's why verse 15 proves that we're talking about a wife and not a woman. The Bible teaches wives to bear children, not women. What do I mean by that? The Bible does not teach, hey, go become a single mom. Because you'll be preserved or sanctified or saved through the bearing of children. That word preserved can be translated as saved. Folks, the Bible doesn't teach women to just go out and get pregnant willy-nilly. Just be promiscuous and get pregnant. It teaches wives to bear children. It does not teach women to bear children. Not all women are called to be wives and to bear children. You cannot make a general statement over all women that all women must bear children. It's simply not true. Jesus said that some are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. That's men and women. Some are abstinent, celibate, and do not bear children for the sake of the kingdom. They're full-time ministry. So this can't be women in general because only wives bear children. Not women in general. And if you translate preserved as saved, but wives will be saved through the bearing of children, what does that mean? That's what the NIV says. It says saved. What does that mean? It means that all these wives, starting with Eve, who were obedient to God by bearing children as wives, they led to the Messiah coming all the way to Mary. How did Mary respond to God, to the angel of the Lord? When he said, hey, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will conceive. Immaculate conception. No intercourse. Just the Holy Spirit causes a pregnancy. What did she say? May your word spoken to me be done. I am the Lord's servant. 
Amen. This is what's being referred to. Not women in general, but wives bearing children. Mary was betrothed legally in Israel. She's regarded legally as a wife, even though they haven't consummated the marriage. Once betrothed, she's regarded legally as a wife. Wives bore children throughout the Bible, which brought forth the Messiah. Not women in general. But wives will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Nowhere is the Bible teaching promiscuity or just getting pregnant. The Bible does not teach women to just get pregnant. But that's what this, that's how this verse reads when you say just all women need to bear children. All right. So Adam and Eve, let's break it down. Wives are to be in submission to their husbands, according to the scriptures. When you translate it as woman, it doesn't make sense. When you translate it as wife, it aligns with the other scriptures. Adam and Eve are husband and wife, and they're invoked here, right? And then wives are supposed to bear children, not women in general. Three strong arguments against this passage. Really prayerfully consider what's being said. Whether you're online or in person, you've got to really consider. I know some pastor you really love taught it a certain way, or you've learned it a certain way. Believe God's word above all other voices. These are legitimate arguments. And honestly, I presented all those women in the Old and New Testament that were in positions of authority. They would be sinning against what Paul says here, especially Priscilla teaching Apollos. They were not sinning. They are not rebuked in the Bible. They were not sinning. Priscilla was still in submission to her husband, Aquila, even though she was a preacher of the gospel to men like Apollos. And it is possible to preach and still be in submission to your husband. And if you're not married, like Nympha might not have been married, then she's in submission to God and then to Paul and the other apostles. There is still submission. I'm in submission to other authorities. Do you understand? No one is without some level of submission. It just doesn't exist in the church. So even a woman who pastors without a husband is in submission somewhere. And if she's not, sure, there might be a problem. Yes, I would agree. Not all the ladies who take the pulpit are supposed to be preachers. That's not what I, I'm not advocating that every woman who stands up and says, I'm a pastor is one. But I feel that way about men too. You got to be fair. I think that not every man who stands up and says, I'm a pastor. A lot of men are businessmen. They're CEOs. They're good at product development. But wives will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. This is the other passage, uh, probably the second most quoted. Usually if people know Timothy, they also know Corinthians. All right, so Paul's talking about the whole church prophesying. I mean, that's what this whole chapter is. Men and women. Uh, in verse 6, he uses the word brethren. He does not use the male or female version of that word. He uses the communal, both brothers and sisters. And that they're all supposed to be prophesying. Every time he talks in this passage when he uses brethren, NIV might say brothers and sisters. He's saying that everybody can do it. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Here it is. The women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. Every, everything's actually there in that verse to prove that this is wives. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. Uh-oh, there's a big indicator. Let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Okay. Let's break it down. Pretty much every translation translates the word there for husbands because it is husbands. So we've got husbands and women. It's already not making sense. 
also in 1 Corinthians 14, and even the whole letter to Corinthians, Paul permits women to prophesy. So now it's really not making sense because he's saying, oh, women keep silent, but you can prophesy in the church. What? What? Folks, when you see contradictions like this, it means the church is wrong, not the scriptures. The church is wrong, not the scriptures. Let's read it as wives, because again, the same Greek word, it can go either way. Context determines. The wives are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves or submit themselves. Just as the law also says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a wife to speak in church. Paul is not addressing women speaking in church because he's already said that women can prophesy in the church as long as their heads are covered, which is a whole nother topic. So as long as the woman's head is covered and she identifies as a woman clearly to the crowd, she can prophesy. He is talking about wives with their husbands. Why? Here's a bit of history that a lot of people have missed because in our modern churches, we don't do it this way. Orthodox churches do still do it this way. The men and women sit on two opposite sides of the church. The Orthodox still do it this way. The men and women sit on two opposite sides of the church. In fact, they enter from two different doors. The women enter through a a women's door and the men enter through a men's door and they split. This is practiced in Judaism. This is practiced in Orthodox Christianity. This is being practiced by... The Greek churches, because it's the Jews who are teaching them. Now, though women can prophesy in the church, wives cannot call out to their husbands across the church to ask them a question. Paul is saying, just like I would say, please be quiet and don't disrupt the service Ask your husband at home. Is this starting to make a little more sense? Ask your husband at home. Why? Because you're not sitting next to him. Why couldn't she just ask him real quick during the service? Hey, what does this mean? Because they're not even close to each other in the building. And when clearly wives were doing this, when a wife would call out a question... It would disrupt the service. And Paul is talking about orderly worship here. The context is orderly worship. It is not women can't talk. It's wives. Please ask your husbands at home. Am I, am I preaching some kind of crazy doctrine? If I said right now, if someone was being disruptive to the church, I said, hey, will you keep silent? Will you be quiet? No. no. If, I, if I said it to a woman or to a man, if a man happened to be disrupting, am I teaching the doctrine of you must always shut your mouth and can never say any words while you're in the church? No, that's not what I'm teaching. And yet that's what we've done with Paul's writing here. We go, oh, that's what he meant. Never speak in a church. No. Wives keep silent in churches for they're not permitted to speak, but are to Submit or subject themselves, just as the law also says. This would be my challenge and has been my challenge to others. I know that wives in Genesis 3 are told to submit to their husbands. Show me in the law where women in general are told to submit. Because now Deborah and a bunch of other women in the law are in rebellion. Oh, Deborah, I appoint you as judge, but you're going to be sinning the whole time. Can you just see that once you step into goofy contradictions like that, it's false doctrine. Let the word teach you. The law says wives to submit themselves to their husbands, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Nowhere are women told to subject themselves to men in general. If they, the wives, desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. It is improper for a wife to speak in church. Calling out to her husband. Ask him at home, ladies. Ask him at home. Paul's talking about here, if you go to verse 40. Verse 40. 
Therefore, my brethren, my brethren, that word, there are, there are three different words that could be translated as brethren. There's a male, a female, and then there's a, a, an inclusive that's both men and women. He uses the inclusive every time. My brethren, brothers and sisters. That's why the NIV would say brothers and sisters. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Do you see? He's getting at orderly worship. Please be quiet during church. It's really not that crazy. Ladies and men, prophesy in proper order. Give a tongue or an interpretation in proper order. Wives, please don't call out across to your husbands during the church service. Everyone can prophesy. Let's just do it orderly. That's the, cha- that's the chapter. That's the context of the chapter. So, Paul's letter to Timothy and Paul's letter to the Corinthians does not undo his letter to the Romans, does not undo Priscilla and Aquila, Nympha, Phoebe, Anna, Philip's daughters. His letters, when he's talking about submission, it's always a husband and wife dynamic. Every time submission is being talk- talked about, it is always a husband and wife dynamic. If you're receiving something, say amen. 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 First Corinthians 14, 26. Same chapter. Verse 26, he's talking to all the men and women in this verse. What is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Again, that word brethren is the inclusive men and women. And he lists the word teaching. So if a woman has a teaching, she can present it. But it must be done in a fitting and orderly way. See, in verse 27, he's talking about order. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be done by two or at the most three and each in turn and one must interpret. But if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Oh, I've got a whole doctrine. Men should keep silent in the church. Paul said it right there, verse 28. Men keep silent in the church. No, he's talking about orderly worship. Wives or husbands, men or women were addressing orderly worship. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy. Everybody say all prophesy. All prophesy. He's talking to the boys and the girls. You can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. Again, prophecy is teaching as well. So that all may learn. Now, in that spirit, let's read it again. Let's start from verse 31. For you can all prophesy. Everybody say all. All All prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The wives are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves to their husbands. Just as the law also says in Genesis 3. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a wife to speak in church. Now it's making more sense. You can all prophesy. Please don't disrupt the church service. You can come up one by one. You give the prophecy that God has given you. That is the Bible. In fact, and here's the part that might be the most difficult to receive. Paul is talking about orderly worship also in chapter 11. So chapter 11 and chapter 14. And he makes the case that women can prophesy in the church with a particular condition. This is the part that people have a hard time with. So again, remember the two camps? You've got the women can't be pastors and they have to submit to their husbands. And then you've got Women can be pastors, and they don't really have to submit to their husbands. These two camps. We affirm women can be in ministry and be pastors, and they submit to their husbands. We also affirm head coverings for women for orderly worship. And we get that from 1 Corinthians 11. Let's read it. 
First one, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. What tradition? Well, he's going to talk about it. Verse three, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. In the old times, you ever remember men would take off their hats while they prayed or did ministry or what have you? It came from this. People used to actually practice this. Okay? But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Which for a woman to have her head shaved, she'd look like a man. That's why he says it's a disgrace. And we're not talking about in a period of sickness. We're talking about under normal conditions. Verse 6, for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Verse 7, for a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What's he getting at here? He says, listen, and he's about to make the natural argument to make the point. So you'll see it more clearly. He says, listen, since women are doing things like prophesying in the church now, have them clearly present themselves as women by modest dress, by not having their heads shaved, but also by having a head covering because their hair indicates that God likes a covering for women. That's what he's about to say here. And also because of the angels. Some would argue that's because angels were in the Old, temp in the Old Testament tempted by women and fell and laid with women and created the Nephilim. This, this wild stuff happened in your Bible. So you could say that that's what he's referring to. But ultimately it could just be so that we're not tempting both men or angels in the church. We're dressing modestly. This goes for men as well. But the point is we're supposed to be modest, not tempting God's heavenly beings as well as those in the church physically. Verse 11, however, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man nor man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman and all things originate from God. In other words, God created this hierarchy and this order and how these things work. So really, if we argue, we're really arguing with God. On any of these points, wives submitting, women being allowed to preach or not, women wearing head coverings while doing ministry, we're, we're arguing with God, not men. That's his point. This all originated from God. God created men and women and he created the hierarchy. He gave women a womb and men not a womb. Verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? This is why Orthodox Christians, all the women wear head coverings, all services. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. In other words, Paul knew, because he's writing to Greeks, that the Greek women were not used to putting a head covering on. Jewish women had no problem with it. Greek women might have a problem. He said, if anyone wants to be uh, contentious, there is no other practice in the churches. There is no other practice in the churches. There is head coverings for ladies while praying and prophesying. And he says, if a woman prays or prophesies without her head covered, she is doing a disgrace to herself. Why? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Okay, so I know a lot of rock stars like to grow long hair nowadays. The truth is, men, if they shave their beards and grow their hair long, look a lot more effeminate. They just do. And that's what he's getting at. Men appearing to look like women, that's a disgrace to them, even though it's become popular. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. In other words, when a woman has long hair, nobody goes, oh, that's not good. Everybody goes, wow, what beautiful long hair you have. That's so nice. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Paul is saying that if God already desires long hair, why are we making a big deal out of a fabric covering? And he is not saying 
all the time under all circumstances. He is saying for orderly worship while praying and prophesying. And you'll notice this. I've noticed this. So our Pakistani Christian brethren who, you know, are Protestants like us, all the women head covered during church, but they don't when they're out and about in the town in the city. But they do for church. A lot of Christians do this. We just, we come from a version of Protestantism where women don't. But I would argue that this version of Protestantism also usually doesn't have wives submitting to their husbands. So this idea of submission in any form is missing. So you've got groups where submission is too heavy and unbiblical, and you've got groups where there's no submission. We're not submitting to our husbands. We're not wearing head coverings. We're not doing anything we're told to do. And somehow that proves God's grace or something. No. Paul's argument is God has given women a head covering already. This fabric should not be a big deal. It's to identify you as a woman clearly. Let's say there are 2,000 people here and you got up to prophesy on the stage. The dress of the woman should be obviously feminine. That's the whole idea. So that everyone knows that it's a woman prophesying. And that actually gives glory to God because his spirit is now operating in women in the church. So we want to make sure women are clearly women and are dressed modestly. The truth is a woman should not come up to preach and prophesy before the church with a club dress on and no head covering. It's just not appropriate. And I've literally seen that in churches where the woman is really dressed not appropriately. I would err on the side of extra modesty for church just to be safe with the Lord. Just be modest. The truth is nakedness is for a husband. It's not for anybody else. I'm not even, I'm not even going to get into the beach and bikinis and all of that. That's a whole different modesty discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into it right now. All right? Sunbathing, all of that. That's not in the church. I'm talking about in the church. We're talking about in the church. Paul is calling for modesty and even on top of that for prayer and prophecy and active ministry, head cover. And the truth is, the reason why women in the Orthodox, in Pakistan, even in um, more devout Catholicism, the reason why they wear a head covering the whole time during the service is because you do pray throughout the service. So people go, well, why does Brandy wear a head covering? Because the Lord revealed it to her. I don't actually force her to. In fact, it was before we even fully really accepted the whole hierarchy of submission thing that it was revealed to her and then I received it as well. She felt the Lord calling her to it. Why? Because she prays. And she does things in ministry in the church and it clearly identifies her as a female. Is she oppressed? No. She's just obeying God. And that's why Paul says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice. Listen, Greek ladies, if you don't want to cover your heads, there is no other practice in any of the churches of God. This is why the more ancient forms of Christianity still head cover. The more modern ones don't. And again, I'm not teaching. So Amish and Mennonites, right? They're, Pen- they're, they're Protestants as well. They head cover 24-7. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm not actually teaching that. Paul is talking about in church for worship, head covering while praying. Amen. Now, overall, with a sermon like this, you've got to recognize that Rich is being pretty precise rather than generic. We have affirmed today that women can be in ministry, that wives are to submit to their husbands, and that women are in prayer and prophecy to head cover, to identify themselves as women. But also, note what he said earlier. Some women are not married. It's a sign of submission to God, even though the woman is unmarried. That's what Paul was talking about earlier, as a sign of submission or a sign of subjection. To who? In other words, although I'm prophesying and operating in a traditionally male position by preaching the word of God to you, I am in submission to God and I wear the head covering because God has already given me hair as a head covering. And so the fabric is just, and it it just exemplifies what's already there so that the crowd clearly knows that a female is preaching. That's the goal. It's not an oppressive system. It's literally just about modesty and proper worship because God created men and women for specific roles, both in the church and in marriage, and we simply obey him. Does Brandy head cover all the time? No. I actually, I don't affirm what the Amish and and the Mennonites teach, which is that it's all the time, 24-7. No. 
We believe it's for corporate worship for prayer and prophecy. Does that mean I judge any ladies that aren't head covering at Ormond Church or online, whoever's watching? No, I, I really don't. I trust the Holy Spirit. I teach it, and I trust the Holy Spirit to reveal things. I don't fault people. I recognize that our culture doesn't do it. I also recognize we've, we've, we've associated it with oppression because we see Islam. And we go, well, it's, it's part of oppression. No, the truth is Islam just adopted head coverings and then got more oppressive with it. If you look at Orthodox and Pakistanis and devout Catholics, and the Amish and Mennonites, it's, it's a small head covering. It's just to identify as a female. That's all. So, we've taught women can be pastors. We've proven that. Priscilla is teaching a man. She's still in submission to her husband, Aquila, while teaching a man. We've taught that wives bear children, and that is who Paul is talking to in Timothy. Wives. We've taught that wives were calling out to their husbands and needed to ask their husbands at home. That's who Paul's talking about in Corinthians. And women in general are being told to head cover, whether married or not, because they're in submission to God, ultimately, even if they don't have a husband. Nympha very likely did not have a husband because no husband was listed when they said, when, when Paul says Nympha and the church that meets in her house. If you're receiving something, say amen. amen. We're going to wrap it up. Let's read 1 Peter 3. A lot of people know Ephesians because it gets read at every wedding. <laughs> the wives and husbands dynamic, Christ and the church. But not as many read 1 Peter 3. But I, I want to read this because this sermon has had so much to do with women. That 1 Peter 3 here, he says a lot about wives that I think would be beneficial. Since we've talked about submission, let's look at submission. 1 Peter 3, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up with this part, but let's read it. 1 Peter 3, verse 1, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won over without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Peter makes the argument to women who maybe became believers at, like, sometime later in life, and their husband's not a believer, to win them by being submissive to them. So, I've heard submission taught only if the husband's a decent guy. And that's not what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, actually be submissive to win a man who's not a decent guy to the Lord. Because then he'll become a decent husband if he meets the Lord. But submit to him so that he can come to the Lord. Isn't that interesting, the difference? We teach all sorts of unbiblical evil things. I found a woman this week um, who was tagged in one of my videos on sex and marriage and her whole thing is helping women leave um, mar like abusive marriages, but she didn't use the word abusive. She used a different word. Difficult marriages, something like that. Helping, in other words, helping them divorce their husbands. Boy. You know what the Bible teaches? It does not teach just sit around and let your husband abuse you, so don't misunderstand me. What the Bible teaches is that when the two become one flesh, they're not separated. They can't be separated unless the husband is an unbeliever who puts the woman away. But as long as he wants to live with her, she must remain married to him. She may separate from him in 1 Corinthians 7. She may separate from him for safety while the elders help bring him to repentance. So separation is always permitted for safety. That's, and it can be an extended separation too. But she's still one flesh with the man. Peter's argument is, aside from physical abuse, if he's not a decent husband and he doesn't believe the word, win him by your submission to him. Be such an incredible wife to him in the name of Jesus that he goes, I want to know this Jesus. Why are you so good to me when I'm such a jerk? Because of Jesus, right? She's supposed to preach through her actions. Isn't that different from how the world talks? Oh, if he's a jerk to you, divorce him. Peter's like, hey, win him. Win him by your behavior. Verse 2, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair, external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting, putting on dresses. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So he says, hey, be submissive to your husbands 
Don't make beauty about your outward appearance. It's fine to wear dresses and braid your hair and wear gold jewelry. He's not saying you can't. What he's saying is your adornment must not be merely external. Be beautiful on the inside. That's actually more important. Right? Because he says that that inner beauty, he says, is precious in the sight of God. A gentle, quiet, submissive, kind, loving person from the heart is better in God's eyes than just perfect on the outside. Verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit, both for the ladies here and the, and the ladies that hear this later. The Holy Spirit is inviting all of us out of fear because culture has taught us to fear a head covering because it's oppressive, fear women preaching because, oh, they're not allowed to, fear submitting to husbands because what if he's not nice to me? And we're given this example of Sarah. It says she obeyed Abraham. She even called him Lord. In today's feminist society, we would scoff and laugh at the idea of a wife calling her husband Lord, my Lord. We go, oh, that's so stupid and antiquated. What, what, isn't that how people would respond? If you as a wife went to a women's luncheon and you said, yeah, I call my husband Lord, they'd all be like, oh, sister, you are in, you're in deep. We need to help you. And yet Sarah, who's supposed to be an example for women, she called Abraham Lord. And Peter says she did the right thing. And he says, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. I really believe that the spirit of feminism is fear, not of God, but of other women, of the husband, whatever. You name it. Fear of something, not of God. If we'll trust God, we'll do these things as husbands and wives. Guess what? Husbands have a call to verse seven. You husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker or the weaker vessel since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. God won't listen to my prayers if I don't treat my wife well. So if you think that the men just get it all, God will ignore me if I'm not treating my wife well. That's a pretty serious warning. I don't know that all men understand that. God will ignore my prayers until I repent of mistreating my wife and show her honor. Not mistreatment, honor because she's the weaker vessel. The same way I'd show my pinky honor, my pinky finger or my pinky toe, my little finger, my little toe. I show them honor. I try and protect them. <laughs> How many know if you stub your little toe on something, it hurts terribly. So you do your best to not hurt it, right? You're supposed to behave that way. If you have this sweet little uh, animal that you're taking care of and it's very fragile, like a little bird, right? You're supposed to be very gentle with it. That's the idea that Peter's giving is be gentle and kind and honor your wife or else God won't listen to your prayers. Woo. I know that. Woo. So ladies, you're told to call your husband Lord. Sure. Yes, I'm not saying that's not, not difficult. In this culture, it is difficult because this culture has said, no, feminism is the way. Biblical roles are antiquated. Don't obey them. Nope. We trust the Bible, even in today's modern day. But us men are told, hey, God won't listen to you if you don't treat your wife well. Wow. I'm supposed to be considerate and understanding of my wife and the things she presents. Even if I make the final decision, I'm to listen and to consider and be understanding. And you know what? Sometimes you do what your wife says. You might still be the final call, but sometimes you do what your wife says because she said what was right. Abraham actually did that with Sarah. So Sarah submitted and called Abraham Lord, but Sarah had, a, had made a request and God told Abraham to listen to Sarah. So it happens. The Bible doesn't teach authoritarianism, husband's always right, all that. What the Bible teaches is wife, always submit to him, but trust that God will speak to him to lead you correctly. And husband, listen to your wife and be considerate of what she shares with you, or else God won't be listening to your prayers until you do. Honor her as someone else who has also received the grace of life. She's alive and breathing and helping you make children. Honor her. She deserves your honor. Amen? Amen. 
Has this been a pretty well-rounded sermon on the topic of women and wives and ministry and submission? That's a lot of things. So a quick run through. Women can be a ministry. We've pointed out a lot in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Wives are to submit to their husbands, not women to men in general. Women are to wear a head covering while praying and prophesying in the church. Right? Right? And all of those things can be true. Good. You don't have to get tripped up. All those things can be true. I know. They can all be true. You don't have to fall into one of the ditches. You can accept a more nuanced belief because it's biblical. Yes. And the truth is the early church obviously believed all these things because that's where we're getting it from. We're not even getting it from the Orthodox or the Catholics or the Middle Eastern Christians. We're really just getting it from the Bible. Right, right, right. You don't so let's read Acts 17.30, last verse. Everybody say, last yeah. verse. That's right, Acts chapter 17.30. Acts 17.30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Yeah. What's he saying? Listen, God has overlooked ignorance. When we just haven't known, he does show mercy. You, you wonder why people who aren't keeping the Sabbath aren't being punished. Because there's a lot of ignorance surrounding it in this current generation. And so God is kind. But that isn't permission. When you learn something that's true, don't abuse God's grace. Don't use it as a license for immorality. The Bible says that when he's overlooked your ignorance... Once you realize what's true, repent and obey Him. That's what we're to do as Christians. Repent and obey God. Because it's been nice that He overlooked our ignorance, but now we know the truth. So ladies, if you feel called by the Lord, answer that call. Don't give way to fear. Submit to your husband like the Bible says. Unless, again, he's being abusive, you can separate but be submissive to your husband. Win him by your submission and kindness and graciousness. Husbands, be considerate of your wives. Honor your wife. Women in the church, I encourage you. Wear a head covering when praying and prophesying. This is what the Bible teaches. It's not oppression. We already have a head covering. A woman already has one. It's not a big change. But in all things, we must repent and trust God. Let's ask Him. God, I know I've done it a certain way this whole time. Was I simply ignorant? And if He says yes, which He has done with me many a time, yes, Rich, you've been ignorant. Lord, forgive me. I will follow you and trust you because your word is good. There's something good about each one of these things we discussed. There's something good about each one and God will do good for you because His word is good. So repent and believe. Amen. Amen. Did you receive something? Yes. Praise the Lord. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. We're so glad that you're here. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to give and support the ministry, you can click the little heart icon down below the video. You also can text the word GIVE to 386-753-7337. If you're here in person, you also can give by texting the word GIVE to 386-753-7337. In person and online, we love you. We pray that the Lord blesses you and keeps you, that He makes His face to shine upon you, that He's gracious to you, that He lifts up His countenance to you and gives you peace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray over you. Amen. Have a wonderful week.